Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of kings and Lord of lords, and the Holy Bible, a book above all other books, heavenly writings that no other earthly writing can match, is our only source and authority for truth. And together, God's people say hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the King of kings. Well, friends, I trust this finds you feeling bright and blessed in Jesus this morning. Today is February the 23rd in the year of our Lord, 2018, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, today we're going to begin a new study. I feel like the Lord has laid it on my heart to speak about the book of James. But before I do, I want to share with you a word of encouragement, a moment of enlightenment that I had a few nights ago. And interestingly enough, in a post from yesterday, another viewer indicated the same truth. And basically what he said, and what my moment of enlightenment was, was that sometimes we become so accustomed to the light that we walk in on a daily basis that we forget how truly dark the darkness was that we once walked in and that much of the world is experiencing on a daily basis. And my moment of enlightenment came based upon the fact that I was hungry to get news about what is truly going on in Israel because Western media is not going to show us the truth. And so I came across a YouTube newscast titled ILTV Israel Daily. And a couple of weeks ago, I began to watch this on a daily basis. Now, my understanding had always been that among all the nations of the world, Israel is and was the people of God. And so therefore, I thought that they truly held to the teachings of the Old Testament, knowing and realizing, however, they had rejected their Messiah, therefore they reject the New Testament. But in my thoughts, at least they were holding true to the teachings of the Old Testament. And I've heard many a testimony of people who have traveled to the Holy Land and come back, and yet no one has expressed that I ever heard the debauchery the shameful way of living, the compromise and adultery that Israel has with the ways of the world. And yet in this daily news feed, I began to see that they're no different than anyone else upon earth. For instance, homosexuality is rampant in Israel and it is widely accepted. The same rock concerts filled with all the same satanic messages are accepted and invited into Israel to pollute the minds of the youth. The same pursuits of worldly fame, success, and fortune are a high agenda among the people of Israel. And I got to tell you, friends, this literally broke my heart. Even now, I'm in a state of spiritual mourning because my perception of Israel and the people of God was much different than what I have learned it to be. And interestingly, as my brother shared with me in his post yesterday, and as I experienced a few nights ago, it made the light shine brighter within me. It made me appreciate that bright light that shines within me. It made me appreciate the opportunity that I have to spend in the Word of God, to read the holy writings of Jesus and his apostles and to understand how much different from this world and the ways of this world I truly am. And I give God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Father, all the praise and honor for this. But sometimes in becoming so isolated in what God is doing with me and having very few people to share it with, I forget the darkness that I've truly been delivered from spiritually and I've been delivered from on a daily physical way because of the things I resist and the things I deny myself. And so my love and appreciation for the word of God, for the Lord Jesus Christ, and for all that he accomplished on Calvary has been heightened in a way a few nights ago, somehow I had forgotten. 
And there has truly been birthed within me a desire to follow the commandment of the Lord Jesus when he says, pray for my people Israel. And maybe the only way you'll begin to understand what it is that I'm trying to express to you is to visit this daily news feed yourself. Again, it is ILTV Israel Daily. It's broadcast on YouTube and it comes out Monday through Friday. And if you are like me, you will be shocked and broken by what God's chosen people have given themselves unto. Well, with that being said, again, I want to start a study in and through the book of James. And before we can begin this study, we must understand who James was. So for that, let us turn in our Bibles, first of all, to Matthew chapter 13, and let's pick up in verse 55. Matthew 13, verse 55, it says, When Jesus was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue. This would be a Jewish synagogue. And in his teaching, because of his teaching, they were astonished. Now, these are the leaders of Israel that have given themselves to the study of the word of God, and yet they are astonished at the things and the way Jesus is teaching. And they said, where does this man come from? How does he gain this wisdom? And how does he do these mighty works? And notice what this says right here. Verse 55, is this not the carpenter's son, Joseph's son, a simple man? Jesus wasn't raised in the house of the Lord as we were. He hasn't studied as we have How does he know these things? How is he doing these things? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Now, James listed here is the writer of the book of James that we're about to study. It's also important to note that Judas is the same Judas that wrote the book of Jude, the book before the book of Revelation. Well, now, understanding that James is Jesus' half-brother because Jesus wasn't from the bloodline of Joseph, but his brothers and sisters were, let us understand who Jesus' brothers were, what they thought of Jesus. In order to do that, let's turn to John chapter 7, and let's begin at verse 3. Well, actually, let's back up to verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he would not walk in Judea, or the King James Version says Jewry, because it was there the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Feast of Tabernacles was going on. And so his brothers said unto him, Depart hence, go into Judea, so that your disciples may see the works that you doest. Now they're saying this in a mocking way. They continue by saying, There is no man that doeth anything in secret. He himself seeks to be known openly. So if you do these things, show yourself to the world. But notice verse 5. For his brethren did not believe in him. They did not accept his message. And that's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, while he talked to the people, his mother and brethren stood outside desiring to speak with him. And someone said to Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside. But notice what Jesus says in verse 48. He answered and said unto him, who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, behold, these are my mother and these are my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now, it would appear from this statement, not only is Jesus' brethren not doing the will of the Father as Jesus is preaching these new teachings that the Jewish people have never heard before, but it would also appear that Jesus' mother herself, although being a devout Jew, is not accepting the new teaching that Jesus is bringing to the Jewish people. 
Because Jesus again says, who is my mother and who are my brethren? Those that do the will of my father. And he says this pointing unto his disciples, rejecting his mother and brothers who are standing outside the tent or the home wishing to speak to him. Now, I know this is something that you may have never heard before, but I'm only telling you what the Bible says. But praise God, this didn't last for long because in Acts chapter 14, verse one, it says, when they were come in to the upper room and those that were in the room were the 11 disciples. But notice in verse 14, it said, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus with Jesus's brethren. So we see now where they one time did not believe in Jesus, they now do believe in Jesus. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he is trying to establish proof that Jesus is risen from the dead, he says in verse 4, after Jesus was buried, he rose again, the third day according to the scriptures. And after his resurrection, he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen by 500 brothers at once, and then he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles. Well, when it says he was seen of James, it's talking about his brother. Jesus went to his brother after his death and had fellowship with his brother that he was unable to do so during his lifetime. That is a beautiful reunion picture, friends, and I hope that you can get the magnitude of that in your mind. Jesus loved his brothers, and he wanted to see his brother James. How beautiful that is. Well, now, just one other thing I'd like to point out, and it's important that we understand this because when we're reading through the book of Acts, we see in chapter 12 that Herod killed James, the brother of John. And it's important we understand this is the brother of John and not the brother of Jesus because we're going to see that James, the brother of Jesus, is still alive, but James, the brother of John, has been killed. And that's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 18, when he's talking about his conversion experience, he says, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and I abode with Peter for 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. And so James becomes a very pivotal figure in the movement of the early church of the Christian faith and becomes equal to, if not more important, than Peter and John themselves. And I wanted to lay this foundation as we move into the book of James so that you will understand as we study this book that we are hearing from the brother of Jesus himself. And of course, he has much regret that he did not receive Jesus, believe in who Jesus claimed to be during his earthly life. And so he's doing everything in his power to make up for that lost time. And notice how he begins his letter. He says, James, me, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes no mention that he is the brother of Jesus because he doesn't want any fame from that fact. He lowers himself to the lowest position and says, I am a slave. Now, your King James Version is going to say servant, but if you look that up in the Greek, you're going to find that that is the Greek word doulos, and it simply means I am a slave, a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am writing to the 12 tribes the 12 tribes of Israel, which are scattered throughout all the land. These are, as Jesus called them, the lost tribes of the house of Israel. And so James says, I'm writing to you, greetings unto you, my brethren. He, he's focusing upon the Jewish bloodline here. And he says, I'm writing to you, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different kinds of of temptations. 
Now, I want us to think about that this morning because you face many temptations on a daily basis. These aren't temptations that are inward that come from the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. When it uses the word temptations here, it's speaking of divinely sent trials, things that God puts in our lives to test our faith. You see, we must understand that these tests are simply that. And they're not here to show us our strengths. They're here to show us our weaknesses. And it's in these tests that our weaknesses shine so brightly, where we lose our hallelujahs. And our hallelujahs become, woe is me. And that's why we are told in the book of Proverbs, chapter 24, verse 10, if you faint in the day of adversity, if you faint in the day of divinely sent trials, When God is going to test your faith, this is done because your strength is small. You are fainting. You are becoming discouraged and woeful because your strength is small or your faith is small. And that's the purpose of the divinely sent trial. So now that you see where your faith is small, you can strengthen that. So the next time you face a divinely sent trial, an issue of this life that seems so gigantic that you can't overcome it and you're feeling like you're being swept away by it and rather than standing in the strength of God, you're trying to stand in your own strength and you see how feeble you truly are. Now you can spiritually prepare for the next divinely sent trial so you won't be swept away and your faith won't be so small. And so James says, count it all joy when you fall into these temptations so that as you learn these lessons, you can be better strengthened and better prepared for the next one. In other words, you're going to make mistakes. That is what has to happen to you as a follower of the Lord Jesus. And that's the only way that you're going to become a more faithful follower of the Lord Jesus. And so it's not that you would count it all joy because of the trial itself, but because the outcome of the trial, what the trial is going to turn you into, that when you went into this trial, you were a rough cut diamond. But when you come out the other side, you're going to be a freshly polished diamond. And so if you understand this, the purpose behind your trials You will shout for joy when you fall into divers' temptations because you will understand that it is the trying of your faith that produces results in your life. It will produce patience, which is endurance. You're going to be able to endure the suffering knowing God is working all things out for your good. And this endurance, this patience will perform its perfect work in your life By creating in you maturity where you'll want for nothing knowing that God is in perfect control of your life and all the circumstances of your life. And that's why he says, if any of you lack wisdom in understanding how this is done by God through you, let him ask of God who will give to all men liberally this wisdom. But if you're going to ask, ask in faith. Nothing wavering, believing that God is absolutely in control of every event of your life and do not waver like a wave that is tossed back and forth in the sea. For if you think that way, you will receive nothing from the Lord. For not only will you be unstable in this, you will be unstable in all areas of your life. And I want to close there today, friends. But I want to remind you, no matter how big the problems in your life seem, no matter how big the giants they are that you are facing, remember that no problem is too big for God. He has you in the midst of this problem for a very specific purpose. And your position in the Lord is simply to wait, to trust, to be still and know that He is God. Hallelujah. And that he is shaping you and forming you into the man and woman of God that he desires you to be so that you can be a useful product of his kingdom in this dark and evil world in which we live. 
and knowing that it is God that is working in you, refining you, taking you from an uncut, ugly, muddy rock and turning you into a well-defined, well-polished, precious gem like that of a diamond. You may feel like a diamond in the rough now, but what he intends for you and the potential that you have for his kingdom will only be seen by the trials, the circumstances, and the giants that you face in your life each and every day. So lift your head high, friend. Sing hallelujah, praises unto the great God whom we serve, and rejoice in the good times and the bad. Be content in the day of prosperity and the day of adversity, knowing that you can do all things through Jesus Christ your Lord, whom has strengthened you. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. May the Lord Jesus bless you today, and I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.